uh, basic farm dogs that uh, uh, were ratters. And farm dogs that kept some um, predators away, that sort of thing. All right. Now, it's interesting here. Um, the, this is some of the photograph of a very famous dog from the 30s and how they um, morphed and changed a great deal. This dog in the 50s, almost the 60s, looks very much like a dog um, of today, uh, more so. But you can see they looked a bit more Valhund-like um, um, in, in those times. And you can see this dog was probably a bobtail, and that's the reason for his slightly uh, two-inch long tail, and we'll talk about that in a little bit also. Now we move, we move ahead to the 60s. Beautiful tie, lovely. And we move into this era, and you can see how the brink of bulb is getting lower on leg, and that sort of thing. Now remember, um, it's interesting because you've all been talking about extremes, and our breed has gotten extremes some places too, and I listen to people today, and I don't disagree with them, but um, we can't get our breed to extreme either. We're going to talk about those extremes when we, when we get a little further into proportions and that thing. And of course, in the, in the, in the American standard, standard is a general appearance. And so there's three things that are basically, it's, it says it should have an attractive headpiece. I'm going to talk about what an attractive headpiece is as we go along. It said they should be balanced, profile. They should all, um, all of us understand anatomy, and we heard the gentleman over here talk about that he wanted to see them balanced forward and aft. Very important that they should be balanced forward and aft. And, and of course, it's a, um, a, a dwarf breed, an achondroplasty breed, so when they're low uh, like that, then we want that balance as well. But the length of leg, it has varied through history. We are getting them perhaps too low some. So um, some people would call me a heretic for saying that, but uh, so be it. Then the, the, um, the last thing is that the dog's supposed to be, um, particularly as, uh, as the movement is especially important, particularly as viewed from the side. A dog with a smooth, free gait has to be reasonably sound and most highly regarded. So that's the third, the third priority. So if you remember when you judge Pembroke's attractive headpiece, balanced for uh, profile, and that they can walk, they can move. Not all this jaunty stuff, you know, where they struggle to get around the ring and all that, but that they can um, get around the ring easily, or, or even better, for purpose, get around the field easily. If you were a farmer, and you, if you were selecting a dog, you know, first thing you would do is say, well, let's just get them all out here and watch them run around. Which one does it freely? Which one does it athletically? Which can get from this, this end of the field to that end of the field well? And those are the dogs that they would select, and those are the dogs you should be selecting too. All right, so these are just some profiles that um, they, they believe. My parent club is the, the, the typical sport club of America did this. And of course, this is all the same dog morphed into different dogs. They, the top dog is ideal, the dog to the left too heavy, and the dog to the right too racing. And they also talk about bone here. And we'll talk about bone more when we get into questions and answers. I can do the and uh, there, there's the uh, information. Because they were, I'm supposed to ask you which one you think is racing, which one you think is heavy, which one you think is ideal. All right. Um, now, interesting enough, the um, FCI standard says moderately long. We also say moderately long, but we give a, um, uh, a, a, a more of an exact, not an exact, but a measurement for it. And what we say is from the withers, is top of the withers, which you can set on the tail, is 40% long, longer than tall. And so without a dog being more than 12 inches tall is, um, is ideal. Uh, this is a national specialty winner, lovely fish. I, I personally like her, and uh, um, has many beautiful things. So I want you to even notice and see the expression from the side, how lovely her eye and head is. Yeah, really lovely, and her top line and bony and everything. Very, very nice. All right. Now uh, this is the a skeleton version. We can all talk about that later. But again, as the gentleman mentioned over here, we want them to be balanced fore and aft, and we'll we'll talk about. Um, some of that as we get into the, the parts of the recording. Just more skeleton, skeleton parts of the dog. And of course, um, 
you know, we we um, we don't give an angle like many breeds do, but obviously this is probably even greater than 45 with the scapula lace on a 45 and then the um, upper arm, the humerus lace on a 45, and the point of the shoulder here where they articulate um, should be great. It shouldn't be, um, we're not a, not a dwarf breed, like a dachshund, not as extreme as that, but we should urge on getting somewhere close to that, you know, with a wrap around front, with angle that can freely move its leg forward and move out from that, with equal drive as we talked about behind. If you, if you have questions, if any of you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And this talks again about size and proportion, 12 to 15 inches in height, that a male, you know, 30 pounds, that she's 28 pounds, et cetera, et cetera. I actually defy many people um, without picking them up to, do, to tell me what their weights are. Because um, like the stock we have here this evening, he doesn't weigh as much as he looks like he would because he's heavily coated. And we keep breeding them with heavier and heavier coats. And so they look they look much bigger than they are. So a dog with a with a with a proper coat that, uh, <laughs> that, that with a proper coat that he'll look smaller and thinner. I can really make a dog look quite large by um, doing stuff uh, with their coats. All right. So here are some um, other outlines that they talk about the more ideal, um, heavy. And these are the proportions, you know, about length, and you can you can see and decide for yourself now. In many parts of Europe, and even perhaps in England, and even in Australia and New Zealand, which is very, uh, you know, influenced by, or the Australians influence the English, or the English influence the Australians, the dogs are shorter cast. You know, they're, it says moderately long, and they take moderate. Um, long to uh, less of a distance. We probably, although, um, well, we take it to an extreme in the, in the stance, which uh, we shouldn't return. Oh, yeah, the last time I thought that. Yeah. yeah. And, and these are all just more versions. I don't really care for them, but they're just more versions to give you an idea of uh, what's too short for us and correct it and racy and that sort of thing. Now, um, Here's two more dogs, but just to give you a, a look about size and proportion, about length, and that sort of thing. The length should be derived in the, in the, in the ribbing, remember that, not in the loin. Too many long loins, it's a big problem all over the world with too long a loins in Pembroke Welsh Corgis. Their length should be derived from the ribbing and not, not that um, from the loin. And of course, we already talked a little bit about the, um, the uh, head being foxy in shape and appearance and that the expression's intelligent, interesting, interested, but never sly. So remember that um, uh, when, you, when you're with and around Pembroke, they should look, you know, they should look kind of going. They should look interested. They look, should look um, um, alert. They should look involved. They should be aware of all their surroundings. They should have very mobile ears. They, they need to uh, have all of these things for their purpose also. And of course, here's the fox and the Finbrook um, in appearance. The, I, we were talking about what makes up an attractive headpiece. So the uh, foreface should be three parts. The back skull should be five, should be five parts from the stock. This is a hard thing to find. We have many Finbrooks, most of them are all equal. They're not, they're not three and five. And many of them that get three to five that are genuinely three and five, excuse me for saying, but they, they look more um, uh, um, chihuahua-like. They're, they're very, they're, they're, they're lovely, I like them, they, but, but they begin to look a little more because they're much shorter muscles. Three to five is quite a bit, quite a bit less. And here are some examples, and, and uh, this is depicting stock and about the proportions of board days. And you see, what, what they interpret as correct, insufficient, and exaggerated. And of course, here's some um, ideas about um, past and present, but also um, it's talking about the squaring off of the muzzle and the snipey muzzle. The snipey muzzle is too refined. But, and, but um, a colleague of mine was talking about how refined this top picture photograph was and is um, to some degree, but I'll remind you, when the brief was first interpreted, it said that it had a snipey muzzle. So we've um, evolved um, into having them um, be different, you might say. And that other thing I'd like to remind you about is that we love that plushness of, of the fiber from the head and everything. However, it says fox-like, and we're getting more bear-like. So think about that when you're judging. 
wow, does that look more like a barrel? Does that look more like a box? Right? And they're getting more bearish looking. It's really cute. We all like it, but it's not necessarily correct. These are just more um, examples. Lovely. The top skull should be flat. Ours says slightly rounded. Um, the um, the cardigan ears is a larger, rounder ear. Ours is slightly rounded, and this one is large. Both different, different expressions, different um, takes overall, but both alert and bright looking. Once a dog and once a bit. Okay, here's another diff uh, uh, deviation from the American standard to the English standard. The American standard says eyes oval, and the English or the FCI standard would say that the eyes are round. And of course, the biggest thing is this: is that um, neither of them should be bulging. You shouldn't have bulging eyes. That's the most important part. And we love those dark eye rims, the makeup, and always, of course, preferably black. Here's some good examples of some eyes, and they give a black head a try because this can be so deceiving to people about the, the uh, shape and, and color and that sort of thing. Uh, beautiful ears on this bitch, just beautiful ears, beautiful flat top skull, pretty eyes, oval, maybe not as round as the English uh, standard might have. But, uh, they just put this in to show the evolution of the head and eye from puppy to adult. And then ears, ears rec for a medium size, tapering slightly to a point. And the, in the original uh, standard, it said that the ears were actually pointed. You know, like the album has more pointed ears now, and so I, I suspect we were somewhat, um, or were heavily related. Yes? Let me go back to here, because this is another basic essence thing, is that if, if, you, if you do a line from the tip of the nose to the tip of this ear across, it should be an equal lateral triangle. And that if you drew that line through to the end, that the eye should fall somewhere in that equal lateral triangle. And this bitch is lovely in that I, I believe. And her eye is oval. And, you know, what's the difference between oval and round? Not a great deal. So that's not a big, uh, a big deal. Is that what you were asking? Great. They show their falls. Just remember what the ideal was, and, and you'll know um, what the deviations are and how they're to be faulted. You know, rose heel ears, hooded ears, drop ears, uh, button ears, bat ears are all, all uh, faults. And this is another handsome dog. His ears a little smaller, but a nice ear. Um, I like big ears, but that doesn't mean that I should um, interpret it for you because our standard doesn't want them sometimes um, this size always. And you'll see a big variety of deviations of where they're set. You can see this bitch's ears are set a little more like this rather than like this or like that. They're set a little more cheap. They kind of come up and out rather than to the side a little bit. And of course, um, uh, the mouse scissors bite, and uh, it also says the level bite is acceptable. We don't see a lot of level bites, but um, you know, we mostly see scissors bites. And of course, the nose is black and full of pigment. And it's very important that it's full of pigment because we are brief as we get into more glamorous, as we call it glamorous, they get lighter. They also start to lose pigment too, and you see nothing becomes splashed or, or broken. And of course, you all know about bites. The neck's fairly long and sufficiently to provide overall balance. And, and that's the most important thing, isn't it, about most all breeds, unless it's an extreme, you know, that everything balances the other. You know, I mean, there are breeds, the Portuguese water dog with a short neck. Well, but everything should balance, even in, a, in an incondroplastic breed like this, they should balance, the front should balance the um, rear, the, the dog's overall proportions should be um, symmetrical and, and be easy to look at, easy on the eye. Just an example of the neck length. Here we go, we're talking a little about short necks, correct length um, of neck. And of course the scapula will affect a great deal of this. Another shot of the neck. The top line firm and level, slight depression behind the shoulders, and is caused by a heavier neck coat and that sort of thing. You know that shawl that goes over the front part of the dog. Will be, and it'll also bounce when they go around. So be sure that it's, that it's the shawl, 
that's the shot bouncing, not them, or them bouncing, not the shot. One of the two, because it'll give you a, a, an illusion that the dog is bouncing. All right, so these are just the same bits, just deviated and, and brought to, you know, all these things are just exaggerated, and you as good dog people will recognize them and know that we don't need to talk about anatomy a great deal because you all um, have a good idea about it. This another bitch is an interpretation. She's okay. Um, and here's a dog, a national special new way. That's a dog, a very uh, important stud dog, possibly. But you can see how he's not, he's very moderate in length. He's not very, he's, he's relatively short, yeah. Um, here. But you know, um, I, I would like everybody to try. This dog is probably 40% longer than tall if you measure him um, uh, in reality. And so many people's eyes are, are misguided. So remember to uh, maybe one day you can take. Uh, I usually have one with me. You should take a card, and make it a square, forty percent longer than tall, and you'll see how short that really is. It's not as long as you might think it is, but of course you add the prosthetic, you have the angles in the front and the, and the rear, and then you see the difference in the group there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the, as Mr. Bibbins said, the code accentuates it. So, ribbing's very important. You, know, you want a dog that has a well thrown rib, we're going to talk about eight shape and how important that is. A deep chest, but not too deep. Um, and roll that down between the four legs. That's something that you don't see in a lot of Pembrokes, is that they have four chests that slip down between their front legs. And we have some examples coming up, we'll show you in just a minute. Um, and that, the, you know, tapers, that there's tapers inside the end of the loin. Okay, and this sort of shows the um, angle of, of the scapula laying into the rib, the, um, the uh, humerus laying in, and then uh, uh, the forearm here, and then the, uh, the metatarsis and all those ones. But anyway, you can see how deep this is. You're not always going to see um, this, where it sets right against the ribbing. But um, they, they've interpreted this as the ideal. And you, you will see it, but you won't see it that often. So I wouldn't pick any singular fault to, to pick out to make a, a cordy run, but the uh, values of all of their virtues. Right. Sure. Um, saying that um, all breeds should basically try to converge to a center line. And so should a Pembroke. Even though their legs are quite short, you don't want them coming at you on two parallel lines. You want them to converge to a center line and come at you. We'll have some examples here in just, in just a moment um, about that. So it's a very good point. But the problem with our breed, the drag of our breed, are our fronts. That's why they all bounce around the ring. That's why they can't get around the ring. That's why is because of short upper arms or short scapulas, one of the two. This just shows um, different ribbing. It shows the correct ribbing. It shows um, a flat rib, a round rib, round rib cage. And that's the other thing. If on this round rib cage, you put a, a short um, up, upper arm and scapula, they're going to sit on the outside of the body, aren't they? And they're going to run in a parallel line so way on the outside of the body, and they'll just come at you going like this rather than setting the foot down and putting it out on a center line. Yeah, and here's the correct egg shape. Living. Here's some photographs. They're, they're very exaggerated. I mean, these are really exaggerated, but you will see these exaggerations. Again, the same bitch morphed into different things. There you go. Yeah, and the front that um, Mr. Santos is talking about is this one right here where it talks about lack of brisket. But this could also be interpreted that the upper arm is short and sets on the outside of the body. And that's why the legs moved out rather than setting under the dog, underneath the dog like this dog does. Absolutely, like the previous, yeah.
Right. Right. Yeah, so he's talking about the dog's athleticism, his ability to run and to move. And so that is the most important thing. You know, if we took 10 Pembroke's right now, just like I said at the beginning of this, the most important thing is, is not to concentrate on all these little details so much, but which one freely can get around the ring? Which one could freely go out in the field and run? Which one could freely uh, 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 accomplish its job? You don't have to be a huge technician or um, to be incredibly knowledgeable about anatomy to be able to see a dog that can to freely do its work, do you? I mean, that's the first thing you have to think about um, when selecting dogs for purpose, particularly Pembroke Walsh Corgis, because if you were to take one and you had a farm and you wanted to have them work for you, you wanted the dog who could do it the longest and the freest, right? So that's the thing to interpret when you're judging. You don't want a dog um, with glorious type. You do want a dog with glorious type, but without part of type is because we just talked about the three components, right? Balance um, profile, and, and to be considered most important is the side gate and freeness of movement. Uh, right. So this talks about the narrowing of the rib cage and, the, and to the loin going down and shows you here too short and long, too long and long, um, that sort of thing. Uh, more important, as I said, it's very important that the um, that the ribbing is um, is there. You can see this is where this bitch's ribbing ends. Can you see the shadowing right there? And she may have one or two more ribs there, but this is where it ends. So um, this this I consider, you know, which happens a lot, is half the back. The ribbing's half the back of the, of the length, of the total length, which isn't good. You want it to go as back as far as you possibly can. Because why? Because that makes for strength. That makes for ability for the dog to get around. Just another shot of... All right, this is all stuff that you guys um, all know, but um, we, want, we, you know, we want those angles on the front. We want them to be balanced once again. We want the scapula and the upper arm angles to be, to be angled well. Just like someone mentioned earlier, that the angle of the front should match the rear. Well, so should the angle of the scapula match the humor, so the, or the shoulder match the upper arm. It's much better that they are equal in length than it is that one's more heavily angled than the other, because you're always going to get a distorted um, um, gait. And here we go with um, Dinky's um, information again. Again, a ter more terrier straight wide front, a wide front, a narrow front, a crooked front. Now you'll see this more in cardigans, won't you? Yeah, and that's acceptable. I'm also not but I'm not um, we have the people the people there. No, because we just opened this area. We just opened this area. In Asia, where many judges prefer this type right here, and that this is winning a great deal. You know, with this type goes around the ring very jaunty and very, they, they go around the ring bouncing a great deal. And you can see that they're short stepping, and they they have no ability to move their leg forward. So we don't want these kind of fronts. We want a front that is wrapped around slightly with um, good legs and so they can move to the center right and have a, um, a good movement. And this is an attractive dog right here, I'd like to say. Good boning, pretty feet. His neck is obviously a little short for me. Attractive headpiece, however. All right, they're gonna talk about feet, which our parrot club is, we're, we're in the, um, we're, we're changing this because this is really a, an obviously bad way to look at what a correct foot is, and we're going to show they're going to show some other uh, photographs here in a, in a minute. But of course, they shouldn't knuckle over, and of course, knuckling over will come from you know um, 
bad angles in the front and inappropriate uh, balance of the, of the front. Weak pasterns, we don't want too sloping of a pasture. It's such a short leg, it doesn't need that. Um, it needs some slope for percussion when they land, but they shouldn't be um, uh, too sloping. And of course, they talk about a correct foot. Now, that's the second thing um, different from the American standard to the FCI standard is that the English standard wants a round foot. We, we call for an oval foot. And so that's the, what's the difference again between oval and round, not a great deal. But uh, we want a little bit longer middle toes. And remember, a round foot isn't that. The toes are all just extremely short in the middle. So we, we do want a little more length in the middle toes for ability to grasp it and to run it, that sort of thing. So. All right. So they're just giving some examples. They, you know, they show that they show the um, shortening of the upper arm, the humerus causes the angle to move forward on the body. They do the same thing with the scapula. The shortening of the scapula, the shoulder blade causes the moving movement on the moves the, the scapula forward on the body. The other thing it does is look, it causes a shorter neck also because it moves forward on the body. Here's what they consider uh, the ideal. I don't exa exactly like this drawing because that's not exactly how um, the radius and ulna are shaped. They're actually much straighter than this, but it's all right. It's, it's something we can work from. So what Dinky's point is, is that many of the dogs who have shorter, um, and, I, and I know many of you know um, far more about anatomy than I uh, possibly do. However, when you shorten the upper arm or the scapula, it also lays flat on the body, which causes that more um, straight movement coming at you, rather than the dog who lays in properly and will converge to the center line. We won't talk a lot about these things. You probably know these. Again, I talked about our feet being oval, the um, English standard being round, toes slightly advanced to the outer, outer ones. That's all kind of obvious, um, would make a better, now these, uh, to make a better dog able to be athletic. These are two extreme of, um, you know, this dog's foot, are, his foot, his foot is splayed and everything. It, I mean, that's just an extreme. Sorry. What did I do? It's stuck. Anyway, while he's checking that out, um, thank you, sir. Um, you, you're going to see, um, we, we take very good care of our nails and we really clean the feet up. The only part of trimming you should do on a Pembroke Welsh Corgi is the bottom of the foot and to clean this up. This is a, this, to me, this is a, as lovely as it could be. I love beautiful feet. But in, and you are able to trim the bottom of the foot and keep the nails short. Obviously, this is just a terrible foot that's probably caused from bad angles and, and the center point of gravity being off. Okay, now we're going to move into the hind quarters. Um, strong and flexible, moderately angulated, a stifle and hawk. Thighs should be well muscled. Hawks short. I love. We love beautiful hawks. They're parallel when viewed from the side and perpendicular to the ground. I did it again. <laughs> or I did it again. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, these are just exaggerations, again, of the ideal. Straight stifle, too much bend. Shows the, you're, you're gonna see this, you'll see. This just shows dogs from behind. You all know, and know about um, anatomy and about those sort of things. So there's just some examples, of the different styles you'll see of anatomy. The coat. All right, so this is a thing that is happening all over the world as we're getting these big plush coats. And in some parts of the world, we don't have them. In some parts of the world, they're, they're cherished. In other parts, they're considered false. So you have to decide what you consider best. You know, a working dog should have a, a it's a double-coated breed, and it should have a harsh top coat to repel water when it's working and that sort of thing. But um, we like the glamorous hair. It's another extreme that's probably not important, but if you go to a, a specialty, you'll see the dogs that have um, beautiful coats also being rewarded for those coats. And you can, again, just like someone said earlier, you can disguise many faults with a glamorous coat that you can't disguise with a dog that has a, a, a proper coat, you know, a coat that's shorter and harsher. And it does lay flat, so remember that. We shouldn't blow them open but the coat should lay flat, flat.
And of course, um, an extreme fault, fluffy coats. We have no disqualifications. So um, fluffy is faulted, but um, is heavily faulted. And it, it, our standard doesn't even say effectively eliminated from competition. It probably should, because if this dog came in your ring and you didn't, um, you would be within your range to excuse it. We, many Americans probably would, and in England I suspect too, would excuse a dog a fluff. Some people try trimming them. If it's trimmed, that's even worse. Um, and and it's, you can't hide it at all. This is a sable bitch if you're wondering about its color. And of course, I, I think this coat with, it says it's open, and it doesn't have as uh, harsh a top coat possibly, but I think that's just part of bad grooming. I don't think that's a good photograph that's indicative of what really is. And then we talk about color. We're gonna go into color. And we have uh, four colors. We have, we'll go into that. We'll go into, we have some examples here. But these are the, these are faults. We have um, blueies. We have a blue base color, a blue body color. We have white, whitey, what we call white leaves, which they have broken color. These effectively eliminated off the competition. So, Do you have any questions? Oh yeah, sorry. I'm going to show you something here and then talk about this just a little bit. All right, so maximum allowed white. We don't want white from the elbow to the stifle to be above this area right here. It's okay if there's a little cream. We prefer that the stifle doesn't have white on it, but it can, that's permissible. And of course, the white shouldn't come back any further than the, this leg. But we like it when it goes in to the right here and sets in here. Now, we do talk about cream, and so sometimes dogs will have heavy, lighter dogs will have heavy creaming, and some of the creaming will look like it goes up further. But you'll obviously see when there's a white dog. I think that um, one thing that we need to, um, to, to cherish and to uh, promote the original intention of the breed is it wasn't a heavily marked breed originally. It didn't have all this flashy white on it. It wasn't as important. It's become more important to many um, people and some breeders it's very important. So white, um, we should be conscientious of not breeding or praising dogs for always having too much white. It even says in our standard that they should have a thin white blaze up the middle. And we see dogs now with, you know, which is just is just one fault. There's many beautiful other things about them, but it is something to consider that when that blaze starts reaching from eye to eye and goes over the head, that that's not as desirable as a dog who has a thin white blaze blaze between the eyes. It says it doesn't say it should extend up and over. It just says between the eyes. So that's something to consider. Yes, this is more ideal. Yeah, that's more what the standard originally called for. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, so we were faulting the dog for its color, but yeah, praise it for. Do I push escape? Bill, question. Bill, yes. Question. Yes. This is a white blaze. That's a good blaze. That's, yeah, that, that's a good blaze. I was going to use him up here if we had a table, yeah. but we don't have we a table. We forgot the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a lovely blaze. Beautiful. Yeah. Does it go over his head, Dinky? Does it, does it stop between his ears? Yes. Oh yes, yes, yeah, it should stop also. Here. Yeah, so, stop here. so that's good. The dog's blaze doesn't go all the way over its head. And these are just some things. This is something that, you know, as breeders we need to watch not to have too much white. There are many beautiful, beautiful, correct corgis who have too much white um, as well. But if you have your choice and there's two similar dogs of quality, which I find happens so seldom, but if you have two and one has the correct markings and one has the extreme marking, then not to um, not to worry. Oh yeah, and color on ears. We we say that you cannot have white on the back of the ears. Sorry, have white on the back of the ears. But now again, we're going to have people who, when the dog stands in front of you, you'll you'll see the white, but you'll, then you'll see what you perceive as white, but it's a cream color around the outer edge of the ear also. So that's not to be faulted. That cream color around the ed outer ear edge of the ear, um, it, it shouldn't be. But white spots on the back of the ear is, is another very extreme fault in our in our belief and standard. They shouldn't have white. They shouldn't have white spots anywhere um, from here back and from the stifle to the hock. No white in here, and they shouldn't have white on the back of their their ears either. Those are ideal markings. 
Now, some people would say, oh, this is a lovely dish, but she's plainly marked. Well, the beauty of a Pembroke comes from their symmetry, their outline, their angles, their head type, and all of that, rather than color. Um, color, to me, I mean, this is a beautiful, um, a beautiful bitch. I think she's glamorous in many ways because um, of other things, other than just her coat color. Okay, and remember they come in different shades. The Pembroke's come from, when we say one of the colors is red, they'll come from um, a blonde to dark shades of red. So that's all acceptable. Now isn't this, just going, going back, isn't this a lovely head? The ears, equilateral triangle, the eye falls somewhere right inside that, that V shape. A lot of narrow eyes and, or ear placements are, are different. And here's that lovely bitch we talked about in the beginning. All right, here we go with tries. Variations, in, this is what we call a black-headed try. A red-headed try, red-headed try, black-headed try. Another handsome dog. I don't think I don't think his eyes as oval as it, as it could be, but anyway, beautiful ears, beautiful expression, very nice. This dog also was a national specialty winner. Oh, oh, oh yeah. We're gonna go on. All right, um, sables, sable, and more, more reds. Another. This is a lovely head. Nice big base ears. Equilateral triangle. You know, her eye, the outside of her eye almost, you know, basically falls into the, to that line. Mm. All right, let's just talk a little yeah. bit. Once again, can we talk about proportions just real mm. quick? Is 40% longer isn't as long as most of us think it is. I would guess this bitch is 50% or even slightly greater. So, is this wrong or right? You know, you're going to, if you as the evaluator or breeder of um, Pembroke's are going to make those decisions which is more acceptable to you and to the breed. But we don't, we, we love them long. But if they're long, make sure their ribbing comes back far enough. Make sure that you're just not liking them because of their length, but also because their ribbing at least comes midway or further. So they have strength to run. And of course, sables, none of these breeds, none of these colors are preferred, um, so you, you can put up any of them in my video. And so back to the um, cardigan, and of course, we're very different from the cardigan. I talked about um, how we're not really related, although I'm quite sure that um, Pembroke, Pembroke's crossed the, the hill over into Cardigan and the Cardigans crossed the hill over to Pembrokeshire, so I'm sure they were bred to some degree. But there's a variation in colors. See, we only have four colors. That's why the Cardigan has multiple colors, like Dachshunds do, and so and and they're and they're completely um, allowed too. And you see, all these Cardigans are moderately marked, and you see a lot of Cardigans today with two, with excessive white also. And we talked about gait. We've already talked a lot about that, and. A Pembroke should be just as athletic as any other dog. Why can't they be? And they should be. You see that this bitch, she has really good reach. She puts her leg way out in front of her, and she puts her back leg behind her. And you can see the continuity of how they match each other and how there's complete balance in that, um, in that reach and drive. Um, not a great photograph to show how glamorous this bitch was, but to show she was a multiple best in show winner but she um, moves beautifully. She moved beautifully. And this is showing the dog kind of moving to a center line rather than moving in that angle that um, Dinky talked about. And this is going away similarly. Okay. Just more about, more about movement. Oh, that's just the, sorry. All right. And then they just describe some of these things where they convert, where they, they cross over, they come too close together, um, the correct movement, um, flipping their leg out, the winging, um, coming wide and close coming also. When we talked about standing in front of a Pembroke Walsh Corgi, and we talked about the legs being straight, the Pembroke standard says that the foreleg should be straight in a column, and then the cardigan leg is more um, bent. And so, but we do want the foot, if we had our choice, Rather than the foot being towing in at all, we would prefer them to toe slightly out. So just when you're judging them, to uh, consider that as well. Those are just um, some faults and deviations. You all know those things from any breed that you judge. 
Some more examples. Some more deviations. About a short, about like our chow movement and um, more about the reach and drive and about a high stepping. You guys can all. Oops, I'm sorry. Another dog, an example of the dog putting his foot out in front of him, bringing it behind. Any questions about this part of it? A dog moving to the center line. See how he's bringing his leg, his leg out, he puts it down, brings it back. The egg shape is shaped. The reason they're egg shaped and they're narrower between, just like a dachshund, so they have clearance for their elbows when they're moving towards you. And temperament. Temperament's very important. Let me get back to that. I just jumped through. But temperament's very important, um, just like it is in any of your breeds of dogs. They need to be outgoing, vivacious, happy. They need to be willing to, to work and be free. You know, someone said it when Desi was talking about the aloofness of the chow. A true working or, or herding dog that's a working dog. They are typically aloof. If you went out to a field to try to catch an Australian Shepherd while they're working, you probably they'd always keep you they're like the squirrel you ought to see. They run around the tree behind you all the time, and you wouldn't get within ten feet of them. You know they would always keep a distance. Yeah, well, and good herding dogs are dogs that are aloof. Shit. It doesn't say anything in our standard about aloofness, but um, I don't think you're going to run into a great deal of it uh, at all. But um, a, a real herding dog is typically aloof in the field. Right, these are just some tips. We're winding this down. And um, we already talked about outline and about the 40% longer than tall, the angles of the front, the bend of the stifle, well let down hocks, the depth of the brisket, the length of the neck, and an attractive headpiece. This is, these are parts of them about the standard that our parent club wants you to consider. They want you to get back because the profile, because if one of the things is most important about, is the profile is most important, they want you to get back and look at it so you can truly assess it. You can't assess a dog, particularly a dog's profile, if you're standing up on it. You have to get back away from it and, and look at it. So we want you to step back and look at it. Um, the exam on the tables for details, right testicles, mouths, ribbing, that sort of thing quality of coat perhaps, top coat. Um, always, again, just like we said, um, evaluate expression on the ground, never on the table, because some dogs are, like like probably Stewie back here, he's probably not real confident on the table, so he probably, would, his expression would be much better on the ground, so evaluate that on the ground. Judge both sides, the reason we want you to judge both sides and look at both sides, because the white is such a severe, such a severe fault, that we want you to be sure that on the off judge's side, they don't have a big white spot on the side, which can happen. It happens many times. And then, of course, this being the most important, it says, this being the most important, um, one of the most important, if not the most important, in the standard. And um, we'll just we'll just jump through this part. Did I mess it up again? We've already, this is just for you to, to wrap up. I think I did something again, so. That is the last one. Is that the last one? Oh, okay. So anyway, that's that's basically it. So if you were to take anything away from this this evening, is to remember if you go to judge the Pembroke Walsh Corgi, that it should have an attractive headpiece. Well, an attractive headpiece is that equilateral triangle, the shape of the eye, the length of the foreface to the back skull. Pretty simple. And it should be just attractive. If you forget all those things, if you look at the dog and you think something other than fox, then you might think it's wrong, right? Or the fox that we interpret, there's a lot of varieties of foxes, so the fox that we showed you here is uh, the one. But of course it shouldn't look sly. The other thing is, is that it should always be an incredibly athletic dog, which many of them aren't. And so remember that they should be. And then also that the profile balance, when you stand back, that their front <coughs> engages and matches. There's symmetry to the rear. They have good top lines, good solid top lines. They have long ribbing, oval feet. Oval eyes, but the FCI standard round eyes, round feet. Six, and and the, the, it says moderately long. So there are many interpretations of what moderately is, isn't there? So remember that as well. All right. So any questions? Yes. Go ahead. No, no, you're first. Okay. You're first. Uh, like for example, many many corgis um, have a lot of um, 
coat yeah. behind. Yes, uh -huh. yes. So do you want? Is it nice? Like for example, for Stewie, he's got a lot of coat behind. But is that something that we should also look for? A lot of nice, nice coat behind. Can you just a moment? Yeah. Sir, can you turn it back and open it up again? Okay, so his question was about coat. Let me just yes, tell you, yes. you know, many people think this is just a wash and wear dog that you can take to the dog show, and you can. But if you're going to commit, commit to competing at the highest levels, this breed is just as heavily crude as many. It takes you an hour to get them ready. And you should be getting ready weeks before and preparing their coat to be judged and to be shaping them and all that. So you as judges, it's going to be imperative that you as a judge actually feel the dog. You know, we can fix top lines to make them look like this. You know, th this dog was shown in the 60s and grooming, and this is England, and so it wasn't as important. You know, her, 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 her hair flips up on her tail, she has this indentation, but you can make them all look like this if you choose. So it's important to you to feel them and how they're groomed and that sort of thing. The other thing is, is that this bitch is um, underlined, just like an Irish setter's underlined. You can groom them, pull them all out, make them look as low, make them look as low or not as low as you want to. So grooming's very important. We, we um, can use product to make their legs look like they have more bone than they actually have and um, shape their feet a little better and all those things. So you have to do, um, get in there and decide those things. So Dinky's question was about the length of the pants. Well, the same could be said about the length of the hair on the forechest. We can get this all up and forward and out. We can also get this out. So be sure that you measure the dog you check its angle, because sometimes you can go up to a dog and his point of shoulder is right here, and all this hair just pushes right back into a straight mass, you know? And this, the same thing, the pants can be, um, we can make a very level croup, where the croup is actually very rounded, perhaps, in the dog, we can make it very level and come off. So the length of the pants, we like that. Yeah, it's just an attractive Another question, yes. because Welsh corgis are becoming very popular in the Philippines and all over the world. Uh, we still uh, we allow uh, crop uh, docking of tails here. Mm -hmm. um, so, what's your take on the docking of tails? We allow it, but some people say, "Oh, it's not. It's better with the tail." Okay, uh, so I, I personally dock my do my my tails. Yeah. The tails. Yeah. Okay, so his questions about tails and tail docking, and so um, I'm a heretic in our country, but I think we should have the choice to show them with tails or without tails. But every person in my parent club would probably, um, they'd be throwing knives and forks right now. I mean. So they think that we should effectively eliminate any dog with a tail uh, from competition. I don't because I obviously judge in uh, different parts of the world and so they have tails. I don't see, the breed doesn't change because it has a tail or it doesn't have a tail. It doesn't change. It's the same breed. The moon yeah. Now the other thing is is that our breed is um, a bobtail breed, supposedly. And in the years that I bred the breed, I have not produced one bobtail. So maybe that's bad. Um, we've docked all of them. And so, um, but our standard, the American standard, says up to two inches. The tail can be up to two inches, but we don't like any tail. So we take them completely off. Okay, so my own personal opinion is uh, uh, Pembroke is beautiful with a tail or without a tail. You know, we could cosmetically chop it off any moment that we choose to, but um, it's it's not important to me. I think they're, you know, it, it, it's just like a Rottweiler or anything else. We may not like the way it looks in many places, but um, if, if the breast Rottweiler, we're supposed to be judging breeding stock. And if we're judging breeding stock and the best one has a tail, it's not going to affect that dog's phenotype. His, his type standing in front of you. It's not going to affect that type, and hopefully his genes represent his phenotype, and so he would breed through. So the tail should not be important. But doesn't the tail affect, they, they move totally, they, they move differently with the tail. Okay, um, his, his, he asked him, do, do corgis move differently with the tail? Um, I don't think so. There may be people who think so, yeah. It maybe appears that way, but I don't think they actually would, because all you're doing is eliminating an appendage, you know, that um, that's coming off of the spine, and and so that doesn't affect pelvis angle. It doesn't affect 
of pelvis, um, soft tissue, um, muscling, um, and uh, uh, all of those things, the dog was already made the way it was. And so I don't think that removing the tail or leaving the tail, per, uh, perhaps as this gentleman said, perception might be that. But uh, we could say that, but I, I really don't think so. Okay. This is an excellent point, and I was hoping no one would ask this because this could take hours to answer, but because uh, we've got to get on. But he asked about the carriage of the tail. Well, many countries have not addressed this, and we haven't addressed it. We talked about it, but so so the carriage being a Spitz breed. Oh my gosh, what is the breed? The tail could be even curled, and so would you like to see that in Pembroke? Not necessarily, no. But you're going to see a lot of high tails. A lot of cardigans today, particularly in my country, um, carry their tails far too high. It shouldn't be carried that high. You know, ideally for me, it should just be a nice, graceful carriage just right off the back. And, and in high, yes, yes, as a, yeah. in, in high states of, of excitability, particularly males, you'll even see them, males when they're uh, in the ring against each other or, or looking at a, a beautiful girl, their tail pops up and you'll see it. Um, uh, under, under the coat, you'll see it standing. But they will, uh, uh, an excited Pembroke will probably even carry his tail someone like this. But I love, um, does it say that in the, in, okay. Not to be carried all the way up, yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so he, he just pointed out that the FCI standard doesn't, that the tail shouldn't be carried. Uh, yeah, yeah. But you know, we have a more, we have a, the Pembroke has, because it's a spitz breed, also, we have a, we have a flatter pelvis. We're, our pelvis is set on more flat, where the cardigan, the cardigan pelvis is set on, set on more at an angle, and the spine, the spine follows the line of, of the pelvis and comes off like that. So in some ways, the Pembroke is somewhat like a Doberman, where it says a well-filled group, and it's a little bit flatter, and so it, the tail does come right off of the back, so, yeah. yeah. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Yes. I have a couple. Yeah. We don't accept it. No. No, we only accept the four colors. Yeah, just like you do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, we don't accept blueies, we don't accept the white, we don't accept miss marks, and we don't call we don't exclude we don't accept um, the dogs that are called whiteleys, which are predominantly white, they can be beautiful. I just judged one recently, and um, I effectively eliminated her from competition. But she was um, almost completely white. a slight creamy for the little red with otherwise be. Yeah, so that's also bad, very bad. Okay, anything else? Yes. Make a beer. One that's 40% and one that's longer. Okay, so this gentleman's question is, is what about proportions? If you have two dogs of otherwise equal quality and one's extremely long and one is 40% longer than tall, well, obviously, I'm dictated by the FCI standard or the American standard for judging in America that I should put up a dog that's moderately long in my interpretation or put up a dog while I'm judging in America that's 40% longer than tall. So that's my that's my idea. So excessively long is not necessarily good. I can show you photographs of dogs that I have uh, myself that are beautifully long, and I know there are people, and they fit into my breeding program very well, but um, I know there are judges. I, 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 I um, well, this will show you. She's, to me, excessively long, but she won her class at the National, both classes at our national specialty, but I take her to all breed judges and they all find her too excessively long. So, but, my, but we are dictated by the standard, the FCI standard or the American standard to judge by that standard. So if they were otherwise equal, I would have to put up the dog that I interpreted, just like you would if you were interpreting, which dog is moderately long by your standard. I'm biased towards the longer dogs. Aside from being an FCI judge. Uh huh. And you, you like them? No. Oh. In the sense that because the longer dogs tend to move better than. Well, but just dogs. remember if you like long dogs, be sure that you make sure that their ribbing yes. is yes. long, yes. that their ribbing yes. comes far back. Equally, yeah. Equally, yes. yeah. But you know, we don't get to, we really shouldn't. 
Um, it's just like these gentlemen were talking about the excessive angles and Dobermans and working dogs. And, and that's what has happened in our country because judges like it, so they do it. Well, extremes are not always best just because we like them. And the people from the parent clubs make the decision what a dog should look like. So do you have Pembroke, sir? No. no. Okay, so you particularly should judge by our standards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The nice thing about the education standard, being specific to the 40%, uh -huh. again, on that side, on the long run, the shorter dogs will have healthier backs when they get older compared to giving a leeway of moderately open to the longer backs. So. Yeah. So that is a good point. When a, when a short back corgi is working, a short back corgi will have more strength and be more agile and have more thrust and because the strength comes from the loin to thrust them forward and that sort of thing. And he said that they very possibly could be more healthy. And so I've heard a lot of things about health this evening and um, that sort of thing. And I'm, and I'm a big advocate of health. Yeah, but um, not but, but um, I think we should all pay attention to those things, and I think those are all very important things. Uh, the Thinbrook Walsh Corgi is a relatively very healthy breed. Yeah, very healthy. Okay, I don't want to do always polemic, but. but I am. Yeah, I am. Why nowadays we have to have a different standards? Why we have to have differences between FCI, American, or Australian standards? I think that we should all think that the real standard is the one from the country of the origin of the breed. I agree 100%, and, and our standards only different in, in one way: is is round, round versus oval. That's the only way it's standard. We both we both ask in our, our breed for moderately long. We just give our interpretation of what moderately long is, and uh, so um, that's the only difference between our standard and yours. But of course, you have a, a description about tails in yours because we don't have tails yet. Yeah, yeah, and we won't for a long time, but but it will come. Yes. What is the carriage for the head, you know, when, when a dog's moved? And we talked about uh, proper speed of gait. Uh, Pembroke should never be ran. I, I know in many Asian countries, people like to run them full board as fast as they can. Pembrokes aren't, don't have to be ran really fast. They can, should be ran, they should be walked at a comfortable speed, which makes them look good. If, they, if, if you see a dog that looks like it could really get out and run because they're walking with it, boy, that's fabulous, you know, but most of them, they don't look their best when we're running with them because if we go fast with them, it, ex it ex uh, intensifies. You see their faults more easily than you do when they're just walking with them. It's better to walk with them um, in general. Yeah. Oh, the head carriage. She asked about the head carriage. Okay, so the head carriage should be slightly dropped. Should be like about an angle like like so, and the dog should be in a forward, a forward motion. Yeah. Okay, so he, so he's saying that um, um, soundness, just like you'd see a Siberian go around the ring, right? A Siberian, they lower their head to the line of their back and their shoulder, and they just go around the ring. Well, the same thing's true of the They should lower their, their neck and head and go around in that manner. You know, many people try to train them with their head. Are we out of time yet? Wrap up. Okay, any other questions? Is, does that answer your question? Okay, great. Oh, Any I, other questions? I have one. Yes. Bill, when did you start in the Pembrokes? Did I start in Pembrokes? Yeah, it seems like yesterday. I, I, I owned my first Pembroke only 25 years ago, but I started breeding them 20 years ago. And we've had a great deal of success um, in the breed, and we've been very fortunate. But I but I came to I came to Pembrokes already with the knowledge of breeding dogs well. Uh, for not only health and happiness, but for also for style and, and, and type. And type is interpreted by the standards. So I understood how to get to that realm and to get to that point quickly. So, but to actually bring in Penworks only a little, right at 20 years.
Yeah, and we've had great success, and that's probably does this point, huh? <laughs> it seems like yesterday. And you know, even at home, so many people forget about your Doberman background. Oh yeah, so he's right. talking about my background in other breeds. Um, you know, I... I um, the Dobermans go back to when? Oh yeah, when, from like, um, like 1961. Yeah. So, I had, I've had Dobermans a little bit of forever. And I also bred and showed, um, I'm sorry, um, giant schnauzers. And finished about 300 giant schnauzers. Showed the top winning ones in the, in the States who were very European looking, which they should. That's the type they're supposed to be. They're not the American type, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I showed many breeds. But, um, yeah. I, I, those are three, three breeds I was primarily known for. What else, Desi? Anything else? No, it's just... I All right. Any, you guys don't have any questions? Go so quick. No? Okay, I'm done. We're on a mission.